and we're going to continue where we are, where we are. We're going to continue moving in this direction of where we're going with this. Amen. As we talk tonight about, again, leaving Egypt. We have dealt with leaving Egypt and talking about the path uh, that one must take when they leave Egypt and how that path is a difficult path. It's a path that is filled with so much uncertainty. It's, it's not an easy path, you know. And then we talk about how along that path, how the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, they faced some things. And when they faced those things, uh, they turned back to Egypt with a desire to go back. Why? Because Egypt was familiar. So we dealt with last time, two weeks ago, we dealt with uh, the familiar. We dealt with uh, the familiar. And how many times we, we we try to go or stay with what's familiar, but f familiarity uh, is a saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Um, you know, it, it, it's possible that the thing that we're familiar with is not necessarily conducive for our destiny. Amen. And so we talked about the familiar, and tonight we are going to talk about the world we're going to talk about leaving egypt we're going to deal with the world we're going to deal with the world i hope you are ready amen take some time share this because it, it's going to be definitely a right now word for our right now situation so make sure you share this and don't forget to like our uh and follow our pages here at, uh, at uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook under Identity Ministries VA. Amen. It's definitely on YouTube and hit that notification button so that you'll be aware of when we are posting and not just posting, but when we are going live. Amen. When we are going live. Um, so it will notify you. Uh, we post little clips of our videos uh, on Facebook. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on YouTube as well as our Instagram and Facebook page. We post clips and um, videos and there's some music videos and preaching videos and all kinds of stuff out there. So definitely follow us on our social media pages. Amen. But again, let somebody know tonight, hey, get on, get on this, this live. It's going to be uh, a right now message. Amen. Uh, we're going to go into the word of God now. We're going to go into the word and we're going to look at numbers, our base uh, set of scriptures, our base set of scriptures that we have been teaching from. Uh, good evening, Brother Mike. Good evening to you, sir. Our base set of scriptures that we've been teaching from, we're going to start with that. Amen. That is going to be Numbers chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 1. We're going to look at Numbers 14 and verse 1. That is where we're going to start with our uh, scriptures here, Numbers 14 and verse 1. And it reads, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God, we had died in this wilderness? Would God rather that we had died in Egypt? Or would he had rather we died in the wilderness? And wherefore had the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to just return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. So here they are facing some difficulty and they are saying, look, yeah, we can't believe God brought us out here to, to let us die in the wilderness. I mean, why wouldn't he just allow us to die in Egypt? And so, you know what? Let's let's make us a captain. Let's make us a captain. And. Um, Let's make us a captain and let's go back. Let's go back to Egypt. Uh, and the reason why they wanted to go back, because that's the place they were familiar with. They had been there 430 years. They had been there a while. 
So they said, let us go. We don't know this place we're in. We don't know this wilderness. We'd rather go back. Amen. God, we thank you tonight for your message. Thank you for your word. I ask that you use my lips, that it may re reveal and that it may teach and that it may preach and that it may edify and that you may get the glory out of this word tonight. I ask that you open the hearts and minds of every listener, that this word not only would be received, but it be applicable to our lives. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. I got a question for you tonight, and I just want to take a moment of transparency. Have you ever found that it was that that trying to serve God was difficult? Have you ever found that trying to serve God was, was hard? Have you ever felt like it was just easier to go back to the world? You know, it was just easier to, to just go back to a worldly lifestyle. Have you ever felt like there were there were uh, uh, just way too many requirements in order to be a Christian? You don't have to answer. I just want you to think about it tonight. I know there have been times where I've thought that way. Every one of us face, I think I said it last last time we were on, everybody, every one of us come to a crossroad in our lives, whether we want to keep going forward or go backward. And I think every one of us get to a place where we think about the requirement to live this holy life. And we often contrast that and compare that to not having to do it, which would con be considered living a worldly lifestyle. And that to us seems to be so much easier than to live a righteous life. I found that it's not a simple process on this road or the, to walk this road of righteousness. It's not easy. Yeah, it's the most rewarding. It's the most rewarding. But it is one of the most challenging decisions that any one of us would ever have to make in our lives. Especially in this age, because in this age, life is filled with so many distractions, so many things pulling at our attention, so many things clouding our judgment and so many things that can persuade us against God. We are truly living in an antichrist system. When we when we look at TV, when we are watching uh when we when we're watching TV, we're looking at TV. We are literally looking at an antichrist system at work in the school system. We're seeing more and more that it is becoming an antichrist system. We are seeing more of an antichrist spirit at our jobs, uh, in our society, on social media. I mean, everywhere you turn, we are witnessing an antichrist system at work, a system that is against God. And what happens is that system that we are all living in, it presents a difficulty for people to desire righteousness. I mean, come on, let's 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 be let's be if we do an honest assessment tonight, it is not easy to just stay the course. It's so much easier to just you know, say, hey, yeah, I, I'm just going to do, uh, like people say, I'm just going to do me. Doing me seems to be so much easier than doing it God's way. Have I got a witness out there? Anybody, <laughs> anybody with me tonight? But Matthew, the, the 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 gospel of Matthew says it like this. He says in chapter seven and verse 13, he says, enter ye. This is actually uh, Jesus talking here in the gospel. He says, 
enter ye at the straight gate, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Again, he's saying that broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are going to be many people that go this way. There will be many people that walk this road, the broad road. But, but Jesus is saying narrow is the way that leads to life. And there are going to be few that find it. Why? Because it's so much easier to go the way that everybody else is going. It's so easy to go the way that everybody else is going. It's so much easier to go the way of least resistance. To sin, to walk in sin, to live in sin doesn't really require much. But for you to decide to do it, it doesn't. It, all, it, all it takes for you to just say, you know what, I, I'm going to go sin tonight, you know, or today or whatever. The hard part is dealing with the consequences of it, dealing with the outcome, dealing with the reactions to our sin. Let's OK, let's let's go a little deeper. It's, it's, it's so easy to just go out here and commit a crime. Any one of us can go out here and commit a crime. The hard part in committing that crime is what comes as a result of that. You might get locked up. You might get a fine. You might, you know, you, you, your record may be jacked up. And and for us and for our people, you, you run into, you get a run in with the police. You might not even live to see another day. My God. The consequences are much more difficult. I talk about uh, in times past about the seed, how the seed is so small, but yet the 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 produce of the seed what what comes out of the seed is so much greater than the seed the seed of a tree is is not that big but you can look and and when that tree has come to full fruition oh my god you could be looking you know the seed of sin is so small but yet the fruit that it produces is so much it's so greater it's not, it's not hard to just go out here and have sex. It's not. But what, but, but what can come out of that, the consequences of that, of fornication or adultery or whatever, <laughs> the consequences of that is so much greater. It's not hard to go out here and do drugs. Drugs, you can get drugs anywhere now. That's not a hard thing. But look at the consequences of it, the addiction that comes with it. You know, the consequences that some people, you know, get so hooked on this thing that it really takes control of their life. Some people can lose their life behind it. Some people lose everything they have behind drugs. Rebellion it is not hard to be rebellious. But the result, the consequences of our rebellion could be you could lose your job. You know, you could lose uh, so so many opportunities behind being rebellious and disobedient or being stubborn or being a hothead. So what I'm saying is to say that that it, it, it truly living for Christ or making a decision to live for Christ, it's going to put you on a difficult road. It's not going to be the easy road. The easy road is not living for Christ. And, and I hope I'm making this plain tonight. The difficult road is to live for Christ like the one that the Israelites were on. It was filled with challenges. It was filled with obstacles. It was filled with tests. It was filled with uncertainty and so many other things. It required a lot from them, just like righteousness requires a lot from us. It is truly a challenge. Let's not get it twisted. It, 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 
you know, many people, and that's the problem uh, that I believe that a lot of people run into. They think that, oh, because I, I give my life to Christ and I get saved and I, you know, and I and I go down the front and I get prayed for and I say, I want to give my life to Christ. And maybe get, I get baptized and, and, and join the church that life is going to be great for me. And what they don't understand is that's when the challenges really start coming. That's when the test and the and and the hard road really start really hits you. You realize that oh my gosh, this thing is difficult. This thing ain't easy. This is this is a challenge. You realize that it ain't peachy cream to to live for Christ. That's just I'm just that's just the reality of it. I know some people can make it seem like it's a like it's you know like it's all a bed of roses, but trust me, if you you can even look at the disciples in the book of Acts and see that it was not easy. These guys were being persecuted unto death. When you give your life to Christ, you are faced with a serious challenge. The Apostle Paul wrote about it. He wrote about it. He wrote about it in the book of Romans. Let's look at that. Let's let's look at let's see what Paul said in the book of Romans. Uh he said this. He said, "So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand." He said, "For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, meaning that I delight in God's law, I delight in doing the right thing in my inner being, in my inner man, in my spiritual part. But I see in my members Another law waging war against the law of my mind. I see in my in, in my members, in my in my body parts. Another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my body. In my hands, in my feet, in my body, in the members of my body. Wretched man that I am. Who would deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I, mu I myself serve the law of God with my mind. He said, I, I, I serve the law of God with my mind. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Now, Paul is saying this. He said, yeah, I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh. I'm serving, I'm serving the law of sin. In other words, what he's saying is through the mind, which is an aspect of the heart. That's the thing that God is calling us to be renewed, uh, to renew our minds. He's saying, I serve, I can serve the law of God with my mind if it is renewed. But the flesh, the, 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 the fleshly part of myself can only serve the law of sin. Can only serve the law of sin. Galatians chapter 5 and 17 said, For the flesh lusts or warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary one to another, so that they cannot, uh, so that you cannot do the things that you would. They are contrary. They're constantly at, uh, at war against each other. But if you be led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. If you be led by the spirit, it says for the flesh wars against the spirit. We want to walk by the spirit, but the flesh is at war with the spirit. So the flesh tries to make it easy for us to follow it. Because those two are contrary to another. Jesus made it plain to us. He said this. He said in the Gospel of Luke 14, 27 through 35, he said, those that don't take up their cross and bear it cannot be considered my disciple. He, he said, who, who builds a tower without counting the cost or have the sufficiency to finish building the tower? That person that tries to build a tower without counting the cost will be mocked. He'll be laughed at. He'll be laughing stock. He said, who, who goes out to war without considering that they have enough men to fight the war? Jesus says, if you cannot forsake 
what you have, then you can't even be a disciple. Look how difficult <laughs> this thing sounds. Following Christ really means that you have to count the cost, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to cost you something. You may have to deny yourself. You may have to give up some things. You may have to even give up people. Moving forward with God means following him without regretting the decision, without trying to govern ourselves through independence and without trying to hold on to those things that we are required to give up. In looking at our focus on the children of Israel, God was trying to take them to a better place, to their promised land, to their destiny. However, they looked back at Egypt with regret that they left. They looked back at Egypt. They had regret that they left. Listen, every time they ran into difficulty, whether it was the, the potential threat of armies coming to make war against them, uh, or if they ran out of food or or, or whatever else, they begin to complain. And they uttered that it would have been better that they had stayed in Egypt. They look back on Egypt, the familiar, with regret that they had left. Not only that, these Israelites tried to govern their selves through independence. What do I mean by that? God wanted to God wanted them to depend on him through this process to provide for them to protect them but their insecurities caused them to try to govern themselves what well, the bible says in in our text uh in our original text in, in verse 4 it says they said one to another let us make a captain and let us return into egypt let us make a captain so so in other words this is them expressing that they didn't want God's leadership. They didn't want to, they, they, they actually wanted to select their own leadership and go about this their own way. They didn't want Moses to even lead them. They didn't like the requirements. They didn't like the restraints that God was putting on them. And the expression of that, that desire, the expression of their desire, it came out. Every time they ran into difficulty, they didn't trust God because they couldn't see him. Even though they saw God's actions, they couldn't see God and they wanted a visible God-like figure like they had seen in Egypt. Oh my gosh, I'm teaching tonight. I hope you're listening. Listen, they wanted a visible God-like feature or figure to lead them just like they had seen in Egypt. Moses wasn't the one that they wanted. They probably looked at him and said, man, this dude don't know where he going. He don't, he don't seem too confident. I don't know about this. Moses, you know, the reason why they didn't, you know what? I, I come to find out the reason why they didn't really uh, 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 reverence Moses as a leader, because he looked too much like them. He was just a human being. Sometimes when we, and, and, and guess what? And he was a Hebrew just like they was. And we all know, we talked about familiar, familiarity last, uh, last time. Sometimes people don't respect you because you, you just like them. Who do you think you are? You, I, you put on your pants like I put on my pants. <laughs> who you think you are? You know, you he just a man. I don't know who that pastor think he is. He's just a man. <laughs> you know, some of us not even respected on our job by our peers. Why? Because, you know, she ain't no better than I am. He ain't no better than me. So they looked at Moses and they compared themselves with Moses because he was a man just like they was. And he was a Hebrew just like they was. And he had came you know, out of the same lineage like they did. And, and what, so, so they wanted a God-like figure. This is why they, they created a golden calf. That meant more to them than being led by Moses or being led by God, the invisible God. 
Even though they saw his, his works, even though they saw his power, they couldn't see him. They wanted something visible. They wanted something like they had seen in Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped dog heads and human bodies. The Egyptians worshipped fish heads and human bodies. The Egyptians worshipped the cow. They worshipped all these animals and all these different you know, gods and whatnot. Let us make us one. And they made a golden calf to worship. And that meant that that, that had more respect in their eyes. My God almighty. Than the man that God had sent. That was of their own. They were trying to govern themselves through independence. We don't want to be dependent on a God to feed us. We don't want to be dependent on a God to fight our battles. We don't want to be dependent on a God to tell us what to do all the time. Let us govern ourselves. Let us make a captain and let's go back to Egypt. That's what they said. My goodness, my Lord. And not only that, they were trying to hold on to things that God was trying to get them to give up. They were trying to hold on to a culture and customs that they had become familiar with uh, prior to them coming out of Egypt. They wanted to just live their lives without the restraint of having to fast, without the restraint of having to pray, without the restraint of having to worship, without the restraint of having to consecrate themselves, without the restraint of guidelines, without the restraint of commandments, without the restraint of being preached to all the time. They wanted to hold on to their to a culture and certain customs. They wanted to live their lives how they wanted to live it. Without God's restraint. And many people are like this today. They can't rock with the so-called religion. Because it has too many rules. So they, so now we got this, this you know, I, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual stuff. You know, I can't rock with religion. Everybody, I don't, I don't do, I ain't do, I don't do no religion. You know, everybody talking that talk. But religion got too many rules and stuff. Not realizing, you know, and it ain't even about religion. It's really about relationship. I understand that. But but what folks don't realize is that choosing to live in the Egyptian system means bondage. Rules and guidelines are one thing. I mean, there are guidelines everywhere you go. We don't want guidelines in church or Christendom, but there are guidelines everywhere we go. You know, rules are one thing. I'm going to tell you something. Bondage is another. <laughs> rules are one thing. Guidelines are one thing. My goodness, but bondage is another. These Israelites didn't want God's rules. They didn't want his guidelines. He was too rigid for them. But they wanted to go back to Egypt where there was bondage. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mm, 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 mm. Last week we talked about the children of Israel and I mean last uh the, the uh the last time we, we came on two weeks ago, we talked about the difficulty that they faced on their journey and how they started looking back. The the, the biggest reason why they look back is because even though Egypt wasn't a place they wanted to stay. Egypt, it, it had its problems. It, it, it got on its nerves. It was a place they couldn't grow. It was a place of stagnant potential. It was a place of strife and tension. It was a place of stress. It was a place of depression. It was a place of confusion. It was a place of bad influence. It was familiar to them, though. And in our subject of the study of the children of Israel journeying from Egypt, we witnessed some aspects of their journey. What we witness is how God protected them every time they faced danger. But uh, that wasn't enough for them to reverence uh, or, or that wasn't enough for them to continue to believe in their safety. God had protected them since they had left Egypt. Every time they faced danger, God protected them. He put a, he put a, a, a pillar of fire between them and the army. Of, of the Egyptians. He always protected them on this journey, but it wasn't enough for them to continue to believe in their safety. So every time they were faced with a new danger, they got afraid again. 
We also witnessed how God had, had displayed or showed himself through his power. But that wasn't enough for them to respect his sovereignty in their actions and their words. We witnessed how they relied on the physical representation of leadership. We witnessed how fragile this group of people was uh, and uh, how fragile their discipline was. We also witnessed how they struggled to trust God in every situation. They struggled. They struggled to trust him. We, we also witnessed witness how their traumatic experiences in Egypt shape their mindset on their journey and we witnessed so much more but tonight uh just before we land this thing i, I want to highlight how they struggle with leaving egypt the worldly system the worldly system because egypt in this instance is symbolic of the worldly system because egypt was a dominant culture it was one of the greatest civilizations and one of the earliest civilizations in the world. Egypt was a nation of people that believed in many gods. It was heavy in idolatry. The architecture of Egypt was one of the grandest and still is seen in our world today. The leadership of Egypt had a hierarchical structure that is still seen in our world today. The influence of Egypt on culture is still seen and experienced throughout our world today. The Egyptians were a sophisticated society with the practices of mummifying the dead, the practices of medicine, the study of the human body, their written language ability, their inventions, their military power, and notably their riches. And God was calling his people, he was calling them out of Egypt because not only did Egypt symbolize all this, but it also symbolized bondage. Galatians chapter five and one says, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of what? Of bondage. See, when we are on the path towards our destiny, when, when we are, are, are on the path towards where God is trying to take us, there will be temptation for us to go backwards. When we are, when we are on this path, there are temptation. It, it will always be temptation for us to go backwards. But if we go back to Egypt, then we go back to sin. If we go back to Egypt, then we go back to a life that God has called us out of. If we go back to Egypt, we are literally putting back on a yoke of bondage. Egypt is symbolic. Is symbolic. It's symbolic of the children of Israel uh, that were delivered by the mighty hand of God going back to Egypt. It, it was symbolic of going back to bondage. Stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, sin, sin represents bondage. Sin, yeah, yeah. Sin represents bondage. It represents bondage. It not only represents bondage, but it, it represents uh, disobedience. It represents fulfilling lust. Sin represents wickedness. It represents profane speech. Sin represents profane behavior. But what is sin? Sin is truly just missing the mark. What mark? Sin is missing God's standard for humanity. How do we miss it? Well, we make a conscious decision to miss it. Let me say that again. Sin represents disobedience. It represents fulfilling lust. It represents wickedness. It represents profane speech. It represents profane behavior. But it really represents missing the mark. What mark? God's standard for humanity. How do we miss that? Well, we make a conscious decision to miss it. Sin also represents. It also represents the fleshly nature of man. 
the Bible references our old nature as the flesh. The Bible represents our old nature as the flesh. In Romans 8 and 8 in the ESV, it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh, they, they cannot please God. Listen, all of us have the ability to be in our flesh at times, but Galatians admonishes us to walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what the Bible says. It says, it says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We are commanded to crucify the flesh and its lust. This is in Romans chapter six. And, and, and I want you to understand that this is not easy because the flesh doesn't want to die. It, it reminds me, it reminds me of those scary movies like, uh, you know, Jason and Michael Myers. I, I don't know who, who tonight be, be looking at scary movies, but, but y'all know, y'all know, uh, the, I call them the OG scary movies, Jason and, and, and Michael Myers. And, um, like it reminds me of those guys because no matter what you do to kill them, somehow they have the ability to come back to life. <laughs> I mean, how many times does Jason have to die and he comes back to life? How many times does Michael Myers die? I mean, and he somehow come back to life. They, they get burned up. They somehow come back to life. They get shot up. And they somehow come back to life. No matter what happens to these guys, I mean, somehow there's a new Jason movie out. Somehow there is a new Michael Myers movie that comes out. You know, and that's how the flesh is. And what happens is we resurrect the old nature. We resurrect the flesh by looking back to Egypt or going back to Egypt. And this is why being filled with the spirit is important and greater than speaking in tongues. Yeah, a lot of people are speaking in tongues. Yeah, but but what's really important about having the spirit of God is this, is that we need the power of that spirit. We need the power of the spirit of God to lead and guide us to what? All truth. That's greater than speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is great, but my God. That's not the 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 the, the nucleus of, of why we need the spirit of God. This, we need the spirit of God to lead and guide us to all truth so that we won't error. Not only that, we need the spirit of God to convict us of our wrong that in order um, that in order uh, that, that we can that in order that we we can be centered on the will of God. Speaking in tongues is one thing, but if we don't have no conviction, then we got a problem. If we don't have the spirit to lead and guide us to truth, then we'll be in error. If we don't have the spirit of God leading us or, 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 or speaking to us and helping us discern or, or, or centering us, then we won't be able to fulfill the will of God. Look at the Israelites, and I'm landing here. Look at the Israelites. When Moses was on a mountain too long, they immediately started shifting back to the world system. They, 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 I said they make it, they made a golden calf. They started shifting. They started going back to the familiar place, back to the world system. They started dancing and partying and and you know, doing whatever they wanted to do. That was the world system coming out. And Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be you a transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, I don't have time to go deep into that, but being accepted by or conforming to the culture of this world is one of the greatest battles that Christians are facing right now. Just like the children of Israel, we are on this road 
And it's not an easy road. We already declared that from the beginning. But we are afraid to suffer for Christ's sake. We're afraid to be the oddball. We're afraid to be to be on, on the bad side of culture. We're, we're afraid of being canceled. We're afraid of missing out. We're afraid of ridicule. The influence of the world is strong. But 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 what did Romans say? Don't be conformed to that. He said, be transformed. Renew your mind so that you can be in the will of God. The word conform in the Greek simply means to pattern, to mimic, or to fashion after. In other words, don't modify your behavior after the present age or the world system. Don't allow this system to pull you into its way of thinking and its way of behaving and its way of living. But what we don't realize about conforming to the world is this. Conforming to the world will cause you to lose your identity. My God. It'll cause you to lose your identity. Conforming to the world means following customs. It means following evil actions. It means following the ungodly principles of the world. It means following the lasciviousness and the promotion of immorality of the world. It means following what the world does, the behaviors of the world. And see, we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to deal with sin. Does it make people uncomfortable? My God, if you ain't if I'm going to church and I ain't being made uncomfortable, then what's the what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of it? If I'm listening to a message and it ain't making me want to change, then what's the point of it? Conforming to the world will cause you to lose your identity, to cause you to want to become somebody else. And many people are doing that. They're taking on the identity of what they see. They have lost their own. So did the children of Israel. They forgot that they were God's people. They forgot that he had already established a covenant with them and their forefathers. They were his people, his chosen people. They forgot the prophecies that, 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 that you know, of, of what God was going to do for them. When they got in Egypt, they they lost themselves. They thought they were just nothing but slaves. They forgot that they were a chosen nation. And when you follow the world, when you conform to the world, you lose your identity. Many people are walking around right now and don't know who they are. And because they don't know who they are, then they try to be just like what they see in, 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 on TV. They, rappers come out and they try to talk like them too. The rappers come up with these new words and new slang and new this. And the next thing you know, you got a whole culture of people saying it. The rappers will start wearing this crazy stuff. Next thing you know, you got a whole culture of people wearing it. They do, they, they do whatever they see. Why? Because they don't know who they are. So they got to be whatever they see. These, these female rappers come out with this, you know, pink hair and all this stuff. Next thing you know, we start doing that because we are people that don't know who we are. So we become whatever you put in front of us. It will cause you to lose your identity when you conform to the world. Not only that, conforming to the world will cause you to adopt a life of bondage, bondage to sin. Bondage to addiction, bondage to being out of control, bondage. And with that, you'll you'll see a uh, 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 constant heartache. You'll you experience constant pain, constant disappointment, constant letdown, constant defeat, constant weight, the pressure of the world, constant depression. Not only that, it'd be empty. Some people, they got a lot of money, but they're empty. It's a life of bondage. It's not true freedom that Christ has given us. Not only that, conforming to the world will cause you to be hopeless. My goodness. All the world sees is calamity and no real rescue. No real end to it. No real redemption. 
no real deliverance, no, no real, no real, no true hope. Their hope is in some political power rising up and bringing world peace. That's their hope. This is how the Antichrist is going to come into power because they are constantly looking for a, 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 just like the children of Israel, a physical godlike representation, a man to solve their problems. So we we vote every year because we we hope that the new president is going to make things better. We're hoping that somebody will rise up and bring peace to this world. You see crime and, and, you, and you're hoping that somebody do something. Let's pass a law. Let's get a, a new governor. Let's get a new mayor. Let's get a new president. Let's get a new this. Let's, let, we need a new man that's going to handle all the world's problems. That's a hopeless mindset. There's no real hope because man can't solve the world's problems. Matter of fact, all he's doing is creating more problems. Why? Because he's being led by the God of this world. So he can't solve the world problems. But we have true hope. Why? Because we serve the risen Savior. We serve the all-powerful God. In Christ, we got true hope because he's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's our Deliverer. He's coming back to rescue his people. Listen, we cannot move forward looking back at Egypt. God has called us out of that place. We're called out of, out of, out of a, a self-centeredness into Christ-centeredness. We're called out of faithlessness into faithfulness. We're called out of wickedness into righteousness. We're called out of self-indulgence into self-denial and self-discipline. We're called out of immorality into morality. We're called out of. Called out of. First Peter 2 and 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that did what? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people. In time past, you didn't have any identity. You were lost. But are now the people of God which had not attained mercy before, but now you have obtained mercy. My goodness. Look at this. Psalm chapter one, verse one, it says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. In other words, blessed is the man that's not conforming to the world, that, I, that, that is okay with being set apart because his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. And guess what? That man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season and his leaves also shall not wither. And whatsoever he does, whatever he does, whatever he continues to do, shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. They, they are blown to and fro. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish that's god's word that's his word we are called out of the world we're called out of the world behavior we're called out of the world's culture the bible said be in the world yeah we understand we live in this world we're in it but we're not of it. 
I saw, uh, gosh, it was a saying online where uh, a preacher was talking about this. And he said, it's like a boat being in in a body of water. Let's say the boat is in the ocean. The world is, the ocean represents the, the, the world. The boat is in it, but the boat is not of it. The water represents the world. The boat is in the water, but the boat is not of the water. Be in the world, but not of the world. Listen, along this path that God has each and every one of us on, this path towards our destiny, this path that he's leading us on as his people, this is not an easy road. Just like it wasn't an easy road for the Israelites. They had to, they had to make some detours. They had to trust God in some situation. They had to face some dangers. They, you know, they they went through a lot. And so do we on this road to our promise. But we can't be like them and look back and say, you know what? It'd be better that I just go back to what I what I was doing, man. It'd be better that I just go back to that life. But this one is too hard. No. Because that life has no reward. But he that, the Bible says, the Bible says, he that endure to the end, that person, the same, shall be saved shall be saved yeah it didn't say he that endure that 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 is that is you know that while he's enduring it he is saved no it says he that is endured to the end shall be saved this road is a road of endurance come on somebody ought to put that in the comments this road is a road of endurance and I'm enduring. Come on, by faith, decree that tonight. Decree that tonight. Come on, put it in the comments. Say, I'm enduring. I will not give up on this road. I will not give up. I'm going to keep the pace. I'm going to stay the course. I'm not going back to Egypt. Not going back. We're moving ahead. We're moving ahead. Amen. We're moving ahead. We're not going back. Let me pray. God, we thank you tonight for your word, your teaching, oh God. Thank you, Lord God, that you have called us out of the world. You've called us out of the world system and culture, the worldly ways, the fleshly ways, the worldly thoughts, the worldly behaviors. And you've called us and set, called us to be set apart and in your will. We thank you tonight, Lord God, that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that is struggling with Egypt, struggling with a desire to turn back, we ask, oh God, that you transform them now. Transform them and renew their minds. Give them a renewal. Give them a refuel. Give them a recharge. Give them a refresh. Give them a re-up so that they can keep on going. Going the path that you have set for them so that they may reach their destination. Help us not to turn back. Not to turn back just because it's familiar. Not to turn back to Egypt because that's all we knew. Not to turn back to Egypt because it's easy. Because turning back means going back to bondage. But help us to stand fast in the liberty wherewith you have made us free. That we'll never be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I thank you that he whom the sun sets free is truly free 
indeed. And we accept the freedom that you have given unto us tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.